stop. We can do better as a society, and I want to chart that path for our writing. You are the backbone of our Canadian economy, and I want to keep your taxes low. I want to encourage investment with large corporations that protect Canadian workers and enrich our communities. I want to ensure that nobody is permitted to shortchange our country and um, sorry, to shortchange our country just because of who they know. I am in your corner and I look forward to representing our business community in the House of Commons on December 3rd. Thank you.
indigenous communities. And I want to tell you that I am on the ballot again, three years later, still looking for action on climate change, still green. You know, at a time, I think, when the UN panel came out and said you had 12 years, 12 years to act, I asked myself, what can I do? What can I do? And I felt compelled to stand up. And, it, you know, I like to say, I want to stand up for my grandchildren and my children. I want to stand up for the people in this writing. I want to make sure our communities are resilient and that we can withstand the crises that are coming instead of pretending that everything is okay. A lot of discussion we hear is about the economy, pipelines, the price of oil, GM, and not making cars. What we're not hearing is that our communities and our infrastructure is not going to withstand what we're going to be facing. And we owe it to our children. We owe it to our communities and to each other to take action. And I am here to ask you if you're prepared to send a message to Ottawa, if you're prepared to vote free in this by-election, to signal that climate change is important to you. And I hope that you're prepared to do that. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you. 
we get to the one minute rebuttal. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. So, uh, in 2015, we were promised uh, during the election by Justin Trudeau that we would have three uh, modest deficits or return to balance in year four and a historic in, uh, infrastructure program um, to get us, you know, to, to get us back on track. What we've seen instead are uh, historic deficits and growth of the national debt, and we have not seen those infrastructure investments. So, um, the you know, uh, to say that we we cut to those uh, austere times with uh, the Conservative government, when this riding alone saw tens of millions of dollars in real infrastructure money invested here, and we saw over a hundred million dollars invested in broadband here in Eastern Ontario through the Conservative government. I think that's the kind of investment that we need to see. And uh, the Trudeau Liberals inherited a balanced budget in 2015, and they owe that to Canadians next year. Thank you. Thank you. So the question was about the national deficit, it wasn't about the national debt, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So yes, I think the first thing I, mean, I would recommend is to end subsidies to fossil fuels. Um, I just want to say that we've, you know, we've had two successive majorities in, in Canada, and each time we've had a majority government, they blame the other one for overspending and driving us into a deficit situation, when in fact we've been there since the 70s, since we started borrowing from private banks and paying interest. So we have to invest in infrastructure, and we need a new Green Deal, we need a Green Marshall Plan, we can't use the tools that got us into this mess to get us out of this mess. And like John Turnell says, we've got to think outside the box. So we have to go back to the Bank of Canada and look at how can we use our own bank to implement a Green Marshall Plan to create jobs and get us out of deficit. Thank you. Thank you. Do I agree? Canada's debt national had much stability till 1974 starts exponentiality. Same in Ontario, same in Quebec. Debt started to double. So what happened? 1974, the Bank of Canada stopped making interest-free loans to the provinces and the Fed. And suddenly now all the provinces have to go borrow from the private banks and the feds too, which meant that they have deficits. After you take it off the top to pay the interest, you got deficits. So, abolish interest rates, use the Bank of Canada again like they used to do before 1974, and there are no deficits. Thank you, John. I'd like to invite Mary Jane for her final comments on the first question. Thank you very much. Uh, as a final comment, I would say to you that I've uh, been knocking on a lot of doors here in, in our communities, and uh, I have heard this question a few times. Uh, someone came in on his way to vote and said, I want you to tell me what you're going to do about the deficit. And I said, I hear you. I listen to you. I'm going to take your message to Ottawa. I fully intend to do that. On this being uh, historic deficits, these are not historic deficits. These are modest deficits. And the fact is, most of the debt was created by Tory members, or Tory prime ministers anyway. So that would be my comment on that. But at the end of the day, we're going to stand up strong, make the historic investments we need to make, and keep our economy rolling. Thank you very much. Our second question is directed to Michelle and will be read by Brock Tufts. Michelle, what is your opinion of the recent NAFTA agreement and the impacts that it may have on us as a border rider? Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, I can tell you that uh, my opinion and the opinion of that of my party is that we can do better in terms of um, and that is certainly echoed when I speak to farmers in our riding who feel once again sold out by their government. Supply management for some reason keeps being used as a convenient, um, as a convenient um, trading tool when, when putting these agreements together. And to be honest, the farmers are sick of it. 
and the compensation that the local government is talking about giving to dairy farmers in, in particular, that doesn't help the beef farmers, that doesn't help uh, other sectors who are going to be affected by this uh, USMCA. As well, we were told that nothing would be signed without um, the steel and aluminum tariffs being, being dealt with, and that still hasn't been done. And, you know, uh, I think, I think the, the government really needs to, uh, they need to stand up for, for the industries here in, in Canada. Um, they need to be talking with those sector experts, and they need to be also making sure when they sign trade deals that they are looking after our sovereignty in terms of future trade deals, and we absolutely should not be bending to um, to trade partners like Donald Trump and the United States. Thank you, Michelle. Michael, a one-minute rebuttal. Thanks very much for the question. So the United States uh, approached the renegotiation of NAFTA looking to um, looking for a better deal. And uh, the position that, that we're left in is we were um, we made concessions in, in all kinds of areas. And perhaps with hopes of getting those tariffs lift, list lifted, um, lifted faster. Uh, but we've sacrificed 3.9% of our uh, dairy market access, elimination of class seven. Um, we also uh, see caps on future auto exports. Um, we still have uh, steel and aluminum tariffs in place. Um, not to mention other uh, reciprocal tariffs that we have with the United States. Uh, and, and all of this uh, included in a deal that requires the United States to approve um, future free trade deals or trade agreements that we would have with other countries, which uh, our government is pursuing or should be pursuing. Our sovereignty should be part of any deal, and the USMCA should not be signed until this issue is addressed. Thanks so much. Thank you. I agree with you. <laughs> the green. <laughs> I agree that uh, uh, that we should not that we should protect our sovereignty in trade deals, uh, and that we should not be rolling back environmental legislation and labor laws and regulations to appease uh, our trading partners. I think if, you know we say we're open for business, but we still have to find that balance and protect what Canadians hold dear, protect our environment, and protect our values. The fact that we we would like people to receive a, a living wage and not drive down uh, labor costs to attract uh, to attract industry. So I believe that we should protect our sovereignty and everything that we hold dear when we negotiate trade deals. Thank you. First, we have to figure out why we have tariffs. All nations borrow the principal, and they owe principal plus interest. So they use the principal to produce the goods, they inflate the price to P plus I, and then they try and sell it and export what they can't sell to the home market, which is why all countries have to export what they can't sell by the amount of the interest, because we do it to ourselves. So, you'll never be able to get rid of tariffs and tariff wars until you abolish interest. That's the reason for them. Thank you, John. Mary Jean, here we go. Canada negotiated hard in the USMCA. Christy Freeland negotiated hard. She's quite a role model for any woman in politics, and she stood up strong. And we got a good deal. We got a good deal for Canada. We got a good deal for Canadian workers. We got a good deal for Canadian families and for Canadian farmers. There's a large percentage of Canadian agriculture that is export dependent and a big cross-border trade with the United States. $2 billion a day in cross-border trade in total trade between Canada and the United States, our largest trading partner. We safeguarded all of that and we will provide full and fair compensation to dairy farmers. It's in consultation now. I've been in agriculture my whole life. My family's involved in supply management. I understand those issues, and I'm ready to go to bat to fight hard for farmers of all stripes, but certainly in this case for the dairy farmer, and to make sure that I bring my experience to bear to make sure that they are looked after well and properly in Ottawa through this deal and others. Thank you very much. Thank you.
question. Thank you. So again, I, I just want to reiterate that in my conversation with, with the farmers here and with the agricultural folks in our riding, they do not feel looked after with this deal. They do not feel looked after by this government, and that is coming from them. And as your next MP and as their next MP, I want to advocate for them because they are not receiving what they should. And in my opinion, the Liberal government has lost its credibility in terms of um, they promised to our agricultural critic, uh, MP Alistair McGregor, he stood up several times in the House of Commons during negotiations. He asked specifically if supply management was going to be used as a bargaining chip during these, nego these negotiations, and he was told no, and obviously that's not the case. Thank you, Michelle. Our next question is directed to Michael Barrett and will be uh, directed to him by Sue Watts. Michael, what are your views on a carbon tax or other measures to manage the environmental impact of carbon dioxide producers? Thanks very much for the question. So, uh, the Conservative Party does not support a carbon tax. The proposed liberal carbon tax that's set to come into effect here in Ontario on January 1st um, you know, it disproportionately hurts people in, in rural communities. It disproportionately hurts us in Leeds, Granville, Thousand Islands, and Rita Lakes. So what we have is uh, the proposal for a regressive tax that, uh, you know, is indiscriminate in terms of how much people make. Um, but instead, you know, if you drive to work or if you drive to the doctor or if you uh, drive your kids to, um, or grandkids to hockey or dance, um, you're going to pay more. And the Prime Minister has said that is a behavior that needs to be changed. If you uh, heat your home in one of Canada or one of the world's coldest climates, uh, you will pay more. That is a behavior the Prime Minister says needs to be changed. Small and medium sized businesses will see no relief under this plan. They will be punished as they were uh, under Kathleen Wynne's Liberal government here in Ontario. And uh, the architect of you know, the green energy program in Ontario that got us uh, behind the eight ball with massive debt and uh, rising costs of people's power being shut off in the winter um, is uh, the Prime Minister's principal secretary. So that is not the kind of architecture uh, that makes sense for a, um, you know, t t to move us forward. The Conservative government uh, invested a billion dollars in technology like carbon capture and storage, uh, including uh, $125 million uh, in, in research in that, in that technology. And so uh, and we also invested in uh, programs that encourage homeowners to make their homes more efficient. So instead of punishing them for, for heating their home, uh, you know, uh, reward them if they're able to have a more efficiently run home. So that type of program that doesn't uh, um, target large emitters Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, one minute. Uh, yes, of course, I support a carbon tax, and we know that the Nobel Prize winner wrote a paper that proves that carbon taxes are effective in changing people's behavior, and it results in lower emissions. Um, I've been watching a lot of blaming, a lot of blaming going on, you know, the Conservatives blaming the Liberals, the Liberals I mean, the Conservatives back and forth, and I again would like to say, can we change our political reality and move forward? We have to take action. We have to agree that a carbon tax is effective when the Nobel laureate tells us it works. We have to believe we have, we, we've got to go further. We have to go much further, and we can do it if we work together and we stop blaming each other. Thank you. The actual graph of temperature over the last thousand years, and there's no hockey stick. There was a medieval warm period over four centuries when Greenland was green and they grew grapes in Britain. Now, what kind of idiot can believe it's warmer now than when Greenland was green? Think about it. They're making fun of you, okay? And they used the trip to hide the decline since 1998. This is the worst scam in scientific history using that trick to hide the decline from you. 
So it's getting colder, and it's not even a very big warm blip compared to the medieval warm period. So ha ha, smartest man on earth is telling you that this is not the warmest time in history. Thank you, John. Harry G. Here, one minute, everybody. As liberals, we believe that the economy and the environment go hand in hand. So yes, we're pricing pollution. We're going to put a price on what we don't want, and we're going to invest in the things that we do want, like clean technology and our families. And we're going to be, we have been listening too, because we understand people are worried about the the, uh, the cost of this. And so at the end of the day, the climate action incentive will provide money to Canadian, to Ontario families that will actually put more money in their pockets than the program might otherwise uh, cost. So we are, going to put a, we are putting a price on pollution because we know that we have to take action after 10 years of no action and no social license and no public trust in the Tories over the environment. We're taking that action, we're making it happen, and we're going to bring it home. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Michelle, your comments. Um, so yes, I personally believe that we need, that we need to be having a, a carbon tax or, or cap and trade. We need to be making the biggest polluters pay for their emissions. Um, the other parties generally who are against carbon tax or cap and trade, they don't really have much substantial alternative to offer. The price of doing nothing is not something that we as a society or as a planet can continue to live with. We cannot continue to kick this down the road. We have uh, we had drought right here in our riding here this year. We have farmers and, and other sectors who are going to be paying for um, for climate change with, with their livelihoods and eventually we're all going to be paying for it. Uh, and uh, also I would question why more is not being done at the government
So the leaders have to sign the nomination papers for, for the uh, candidates who sit on the ballot. But the grassroots democracy rises up and they pick their person to run as their member of parliament. They're hoping to send that person forward, but that person doesn't go anywhere until the leader signs those nomination papers. And if we remove that rope from around their neck, they would be free to act in the best interest of their constituents, the best interest of their riding, and we wouldn't have this political party rivalry, and we would be able to move forward as a coalition of members of parliament who want to work together for the betterment of Canada. That's my dream, is that if I was in the House of Commons as the member of parliament, for this riding, I would encourage cooperation across every political line because we need every hand on deck. And I said this in this riding in 2015, and I see the clock ticking. I am compelled to stand here with everything that I've got to tell you we need to find a new way. As you heard these two people talking, the Conservative and the Liberal, it's not working. It's not working. How can we get out of this mess? We have to change the way we're doing things. And Greens are prepared to do that. We can't tip the balance of power in the House of Commons, but we do have significant influence and we are a moral compass for this country. Thank you. Thank you. John, your comments. This is my flyer for federal elections. It's got me, the organ grinder, the monkey with the Lex software in front of the Bank of Canada's computer, and the party leaders who don't have a program. Who would you vote for, the monkey with the program or the party leaders without? So yeah, that's what I would do. I would install the Lex in the Bank of Canada's computer. If that doesn't work, I'd set up a time bank. If that doesn't work, I'd pay kids with bus tickets. But most of all, we got to stop these morons from wasting carbon taxes on something that's not a problem, okay? They lied to you. You still believe it? You still swallow it? They used a trick to hide a decline. It's colder now than 98, and these clowns are acting like it's warmer. Wake up! Thank you, John. Very keen. Well, in terms of the platform, I think that what I would have to do is to take two out of the uh, voices that I have heard here in these Grenville Thousand Islands and Greater Lakes. We need to continue our focus on jobs and the economy. We need to continue our focus on social issues such as affordable housing and investing in our children. We've done that through the Canada Child Benefit, where nine out of ten families are better off uh, under the Canada Child Benefit than they were under the previous program that was brought forward by the Tories. Uh, we need to continue to invest in our infrastructure. We have to carry on this plan in order to, in order to make life better for everyone here in these Grenville Thousand Islands and Rio Lakes. I'd be taking those priorities to Ottawa because those are the priorities that you have articulated to me. Thank you. Clear, and they've been common. Um, you know, one issue that's uh, you know 
every corner of this riding. Uh, people are very concerned about Phoenix. Uh, you know, people, our public servants need to get paid. We have a lot of corrections officers. We have CBSA officers here, and you know, this issue needs to get resolved. Uh, you know, a, a bipartisan uh, group to draw a resolution to that uh, needs to be top priority uh, in Ottawa. But I'd also like to say that the uh, issue of broadband availability here in our region, that was an investment uh, made by the Conservatives uh, when we were in government. And now we have uh, Industry Canada, uh, the federal government, looking at auctioning off the broadband spectrum that um, thousands of people in our communities rely on. This is something that needs to be protected. It's something that needs to be improved. And the federal government needs to be told, the local government needs to be told uh, to keep their hands off our internet. Thanks. Thank you. Your final comments. I think my, my final comment, first I would like to say that, um, you know, when you have the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and world-renowned scientists all working together and trying to convince the world to act, sometimes people freeze up and I think we have to look back in history when we had to turn around on a dime we go back to the Second World War and we say, gee, you know, one day we were manufacturing, you know, cars, whatever it was, washing machines, and we flipped that around and all of a sudden we became a war machine and we were manufacturing planes and equipment. We can respond, you know, and I think what we have to understand is we can't respond to the system that we're in right now because we're hearing about pipelines and jobs and the economy. You know, I mean, the Greens have a platform that includes universal pharmacare and childcare. And yeah, we want to create jobs. We want to create a low carbon economy. Thank you, Larry.
what I would suggest to you is that you do need a strong voice, someone who's going to stand up really uh, strong and hard for you in the uh, in Ottawa and bring the needs of this riding to Ottawa. And I would be that voice. Uh, broadband is certainly something we've been hearing about. We've all experienced it as we drive around the riding. Uh, we know that uh, we need uh, proper cell service, not just so that we can connect with one another, but also for things like homework for our kids and uh, healthcare and many other uses. It's become part of the infrastructure of our community, and infrastructure is all about building communities and networking and, and working and living together. So I would say that is uh, number one. There's a Connected Innovate program, $500 million available. I would be working hard to bring that here to Leeds, Bramble, Thousand Islands, and Rio Lakes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Michelle, your response. Thank you. So, so one thing that I would really like to see um, improved upon and expanded is, is Medicare. We need to be adding on what should never have been left out in the first place, and that's dental care, that's optical care, and that's pharma care. And again, there will be money saved if we put that all under the Medicare umbrella as it was meant to be. We have people who are suffering because they, they can't keep up with, with the treatments that they need. We have people who are ending up in hospital and becoming, are, you know, adding more burden to our, our healthcare system because their conditions become acute. Or we have people who just frankly aren't getting any treatment at all. If people can't afford to go to the dentist, they don't go to the dentist. And that's something that we definitely need to be doing better as a country. And I would certainly like to, uh, to be part of, of bringing that to our Medicare. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Your response. Yeah, thanks very much for the question. I think that um, having a predictable and stable funding available for programs in our community that uh, are you know, executed by people who are on the ground, uh, we've seen tremendous success with that. And, and historically, the uh, Community Futures Development Corporations and the Eastern Ontario Development Program, uh, we've seen great investment and great decisions made, uh, great programs executed on business loans uh, through that program. And from one end of the riding to the other, uh, we've had tremendous success. It's, um, uh, it's a bit disappointing that uh, that program has not been uh, renewed, and that was a program that our member of uh, Parliament, Gordon Brown, uh, took full advantage of in leveraging federal dollars here in our riding, and we all saw the benefits of those programs, of those business loans, and those investments. And that's in the uh, you know for in, in every sector. So I would hope that a program like uh, the uh, EODP could be renewed. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I think uh, you know I would like to implement the guaranteed livable income which is a citizen's di dividend for every single Canadian. And we know that we have money, we just bought a pipeline, so we've got lots of it. We have, I mean, written off loans, I mean, billions of dollars of loans to the private sector. So guaranteed livable income, which would bring people out of poverty, would change our discussion, it would change our dialogue, it would alleviate our fear, so that we could focus on the issues that are before us. Uh, I mean, we advocate for universal pharma care. We talk about universal daycare program. We have to ask ourselves as Canadians, why don't we have that? That's a great idea. So I think, I mean, getting people out of poverty so that we could talk and we can have a dialogue that is respectful and focused on the challenges before us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bonds is the greatest idea I've ever seen to pop a nation out of poverty into affluence. And it worked for Argentina, and it can work for us. Look, I'll pay my tax for army and police to handle strife. I'll pay my taxes for doctors and nurses who protect my life. I'll pay my tax for all my games with Harry Rose's sword. I'll pay my tax for social servants helping out the poor. I'll even pay my tax for bureaucrats with no regret. I only object to paying tax for interest on debt. Thank you. Our next question is geared more towards local and regional issues. 
and it is directed to Mary Jean McFall and will be asked by Sue Watt. Mary Jean, if elected, what would your top three priorities for this Friday be? Thank you for the question, Sue. Again, I come back to um, the conversations that I've had at the door with constituents who are uh, worried about the future in terms of the local economy. When you see Procter & Gamble planning to close in 2020, um, they're worried about the local economy. They're, they're worried because their kids can't find uh, well-paying uh, jobs here in the area and have to leave town in order to be able to find those jobs. So ensuring that we do have um, all of the tools at hand to spur the local economy would be a top priority for me. I would say to you that as a lawyer uh, practicing law in Brockville, I've seen the engine that small business is for the local economy, and certainly the Liberal government has reduced small business tax from 11 to 9 percent starting Jan 1, 2019. We've also undertaken um, uh, incentives in the most recent uh, economic statement to again make us allow us to be competitive with our American friends. I would say to you too that the, the second issue that I hear at the door is uh, certainly about social welfare issues, affordable housing, the national housing strategy that the Liberal government has come forward with. I'd like to see that brought right to bear here in these Grenville Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. You need to look only to the Wall Street Village project just up the street from us that as a great example of what can and should be done. I'm proud to say that I had a little bit to do with that along the way when uh, George Smith came to me to incorporate the company and help him help the team, his team, assemble some of the properties. So we've, we've seen that and I would like to see more projects like that come to bear, the grassroots projects that people undertake because they know the need is there. We also need to make sure that we are standing up for the issues that our folks have as regards our lower income earners in our communities and the national uh, poverty reduction strategy will certainly help with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Michelle, comments. Thank you very much. So I, I certainly uh, have heard and, and I know that affordable housing is, is a priority for, for us here in our riding. It's unfortunate that although investment has been promised by the Liberal government, most of it is kind of being dangled as a carrot for after the next general election and we have needs right now. It's, it's cold, it's winter, um, and we need emergency funding for that here right now. Um, I also, again, want to, to focus on uh, faster access for vets and their families, vets and their families to um, the services and, and benefits that they need. Um, the time that they're waiting is, is far too long. They're suffering. They're having to pay out of, out of pocket when they can't really afford it. And that's something that absolutely needs to be a priority here, and I look forward to advocating for that. Thank you. So thanks very much for the question. You know, to go back to um, my response to the last question about uh, you know, financing from the federal government for programs right here in our riding, and we've seen good success when uh, we have collaboration between different levels of government. And my experience as a municipal councillor uh, was part of successive councils having a vision uh, to work with different levels of government and working with the province. Uh, the municipality of Edwardsburg Cardinal was able to uh, get site certification and approval and be advertised by the province of Ontario uh, to the end of uh, attracting, developing, building and opening the new Giant Tiger Distribution Centre which brought 350 net new direct jobs and countless hundred indirect jobs. That comes from cooperation, it comes from partnership and there's a real role for the federal government to play in concert with their provincial municipal partners to make sure that we can get infrastructure projects and new employers here in our region. Thanks. I think uh, some of the immediate needs that I see in our community, in fact, is our aging population and uh, stress on the uh, health care system, uh, people concerned about how far their pension is going to go. 
people concerned about whether they can afford for par uh, parking at the hospitals in Ottawa. So health care is a priority. It is an absolute priority because we know our population is aging. Um, this is a, a stress that we have. And we don't have the jobs in place for the youth to actually sustain all the costs that we're going to have to incur um, taking care of our seniors. So affordable, affordable housing, but of course employment. But I, I believe health care and care of our seniors is our first priority. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Full employment for adults with bond bucks and time bucks. Full employment for youth with bus bucks and not wasting any money on global warming. Now why did they change the name to climate change? Who knows? Global warming stopped, so now they want to have it both ways. Look, still fooled by trip to height decline, still Justin leads the way. I tried to stop climate from changing on his resume. Please. Now you people don't like being laughed at by someone who says he's, I'm smarter than you and you're a bunch of morons. And I can understand how you feel, but just say it out loud. I want to stop climate from changing. I can understand from getting warmer or getting colder, but you want to stop it from changing. They made you into a stupid proposition from a previous rational one. If it was warming, it was good to stop it. But it's not warming, so now you just want to stop change. Duh. Thank you, John. Mary Jean, final comments, please. So, you know, all politics are local and we were asked about local issues. And I think we need to, you know, stop and think about infrastructure investments. Stop and think about the uh, job creation programs we have here. I have some experience at EODP as a lawyer because I helped to do some of the loan deals for, uh, for the small businesses that were using those programs. I understand the importance of it and EODP is not being cancelled. And, uh, and that is certainly something that we need to make sure that we work really, really hard to preserve and maintain because it is a great program. On infrastructure, County Road, 3, 40, County Road 43 in Kempel is the number one roads and bridges infrastructure project in this riding, and broadband is the number one throughout. So these are the local priorities that I'm seeing. Investment in tourism dollars right here in Brockville because that's part of our future of our economy here. We need to work hard to bring them here. We need to le leverage the assets that we have right here and make things happen with those dollars. Leverage them. Thank you, Mary Jean. Right. I'd like to remind the audience this is a respectful debate for all. Everyone is entitled to their, their principle, their opinion, and entitled to their speech. Please, I remind you the first rule, no heckling, no interruption of the speakers. Let's move on now to the next question for Michelle. Uh, this will be asked by Tom Steele. Michelle, what unique talents and insights do you have to effectively represent this riding if elected? And what can your constituents expect from your representation? So my unique talents and, and insights, um, as a starter, I'm, I'm a stay-at-home mom right now of, of four kids. Um, I understand what it's like to try and, and make things uh, to make things come together, make it from week to, to week, uh, make it from paycheck to paycheck. I understand what the priorities of, of people are who are perhaps uh, not independently wealthy. Um, a couple of years ago, I, I fought very hard against the Wind Liberals to keep our uh, our elementary school in in the village of Athens open and we were successful, and I'm very proud of that. I also have experience in, um, in the natural resources field. I have a diploma as a forestry technician, and I take environmental responsibility very seriously. I also have experience in the first response medical field, and I understand, um, I understand the, the commitment that, um, that those people um, put forth when, when they do those jobs. I understand the needs of, of people um, 
in, in these areas where um, they, they put their lives on, on the line every day, um, looking at priorities like um, you know, PTSD and, and, and mental health care for, for them and, and for everyone. Um, for me, as, as your MP, you'll find a strong advocate. You'll find someone who's uh, eager to sit down with any group at all. Um, I, I have, you know, I was proud to walk in the uh, Gay Pride Parade in, in Rockville just a few months ago. There is no group that is not welcome in my office, and I look forward to building partnerships with, uh, with all the groups across our riding. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, thanks very much for the question, um, and definitely hats off uh, to Michelle and everyone who took part in the Save Our School programs across uh, across um, our riding. And um, and that goes to uh, where some of my experience comes from as a municipal councillor. And you know, I, I learned very quickly that um, what your constituents want may not be what the uh, political will is, whether it's around the county council table as uh, you know. Um, as a, as a lower tier municipal councillor, um, you know, going against the grain of that, but speaking for the constituents and making sure that people know that uh, that is the people that um, the power rests with. I, I, my experience as a member of the Canadian Forces and, and as a veteran, uh, it gives me a view and gives me insight into what the needs are of that community, and I look forward to advocating on their behalf. And you know, it speaks to my service and my commitment to public service. Um, you know, whether it's the military, as a municipal councillor, um, thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> comments? Okay, what unique talents and insights. I'm, I'm actually the only Indigenous woman on the ballot. Um, I, I, come from a, I come from a tradition where we are stewards of land from uh, generations of people who have lived here in Canada for thousands of years. Uh, understanding that our ecosystems are interconnected and that we are interconnected with our ecosystems. I also have experience in international, national, provincial, regional, and local forums working with industry, government, civil society, indigenous communities, and governments. I have business skills, I'm a small business owner, I am a journalist, and I am prepared to work in any forum with any who wants to get things done. So, I am really, thank you. Thank you. Well, I am the only person in the country who was teaching assistant of Canada's only mathematics and gambling course for four years. Now, you might not think that's too much, but being able to figure out and pick winners in math is a hell of an asset. How many people can pick a winner with math? Say, Mr. Spock could do it. He'd say, Captain, if you do this, plan A, you'll win two times out of ten. But if you go with plan B, four times out of ten. And Kirk goes, oh, I feel lucky. I'm going with plan A. I relieve you of command. So the point is, the mathematics of gambling has changed the ability to determine the best move. And I possess that skill, or that talent, or that education. So, I got great software, is my point. Thank you, John. Mary Jean, your comments, please. I was born and raised here. I have lived here, worked here, volunteered here pretty much my whole life. I have this community in my heart. You know, uh, a couple of people now have said to me, hey, it's great you're on the ballot, Mary Jean. The last time I voted for you, I guess they were out of the country in 2015, was when you were running for head girl at Downs Island Secondary School in 1978. So uh, it's, uh, it really is uh, a long, long, lifelong proposition for me to have the opportunity to be your member of parliament. I've already explained my experience in my volunteering, um, practicing law here. I got to know a lot of people got to know their needs and I helped them solve their problems, whether it's business problems, social or family problems. And I've also worked on the Hill with Mr. McCauley as his chief of staff um, in the Department of Agriculture. So I have a wide range of experience and it would be my pleasure and my honor to bring it to Ottawa on behalf of all of you as your member of parliament. Thank you. I don't have the, the political experience.
experience of others. And I'm not a career politician, I don't profess to be, but I'm here for the right reasons. I'm here because I genuinely care. I'm here because I really want to make life better for everybody in our riding. Um, and I feel that, that I have the, the passion and, and, and drive to deliver on that. On December 3rd, I hope that you, you look beyond uh, perhaps usual voting habits and beyond color uh, and consider voting for me. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Our next question of the evening is directed to Michael Barrett and will be asked by Brock Tufts. Michael, in light of recent issues with youth crime in our riding, there is much interest in examining the effectiveness of the Youth Criminal Justice Act. How would you respond to those concerns? Uh, thanks very much for the question. So, uh, I think it's important that, um, that, that first of all, we, we engage our youth and offer programs for them that um, you know, give them something to do. They need facilities, they need uh, recreation programs, there needs to be services available. Um, there needs to be uh, social services available, whether it's uh, mental health or addiction as well. Those, those are things that, uh, that, that definitely need to be in place. But, you know, you look at some of the proposed criminal justice reforms that the Liberal government is uh, prepared to undertake, and, you know, proposing to transition from, you know, 10-year uh, sentences for serious criminal offenses like uh, sex trafficking in minors or participating in a terrorist offense uh, or a terrorist organization, um, taking that from being a 10-year indictable offense to two years less a day as a summary conviction is very much in the wrong direction, it's sending the wrong message uh, to people. These things are deeply concerning. And I spoke to someone on the doorstep today here in Brockville who, um, whose family are they're victims of crime. They're victims of a very serious crime that occurred here in the city. And um, they feel re victimized every time there's, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we look and we propose to have more care and concern for the offender than for the victims and their families. And so uh, there needs to be uh, the services available. We need, to, um, we need to try and keep people off that track. But once someone makes a decision and they break the law and they break the trust that the community can have in them, uh, it's incumbent on the government to met out uh, a you know uh, a fair and just repercussion for that, and uh, I implore the you know the government uh, to do that with Bill C seventy five. And as your member of Parliament, I would carry that message to Ottawa uh, with great vigor. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, I, I think we have to understand there is a separation between uh, politics and justice, between governance and policing. And we have to always be mindful of that. And uh, I think with, um, you know, with the Justice Act, we have a point of reference and we cannot forget as a country, if we go back to the 1930s, that our government had a tendency to criminalize our young people who were out of work because there was a lot of social upheaval the Winnipeg strikes for an example of that. Um, and we have to take care and be ever vigilant that we don't go back to those days when we used to round up all our young men and lock them in work camps and tie their food stamps to them digging holes in the middle of the forest in northern Canada. So I think uh, we must always be vigilant to separate our government and our politics and don't drag justice issues onto the floor in the House of Commons that we write legislation and we set it in place for the justice to administer. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. So, how to punish youth who get into trouble because they got no money and they got no jobs? Well, yeah, you can develop more programs and more courts and more cops and better laws. Or you can give them a job and some money to spend. So they don't have to mug you or steal from your car or get into trouble. So back to the solution, which is jobs for the youth, so that you don't need all these programs to punish your kids. Thank you, Jim. Mary Jean, comments. So I know there have been concerns with uh, 
youth crime or issues with our, our youth in recent times. I went to a neighborhood watch meeting about a month ago with my friend Judy, and uh, we heard uh, some expressions of real concern by the neighbors in our community uh, right here in downtown Brockville. I want to give a shout out to the Brockville Watchdogs. There's a group of young people who uh, uh, walk the streets of Brockville at night to try to do what they can to help uh, keep kids uh, safe and keep them off the street and to uh, help solve things before they become a major problem. When you uh, ask, what, what can I do about it? You just have to look to people like that who are standing up strong. So, you know, we need to invest in our kids. We need the youth employment strategy. The Liberals have doubled the Canada Summer Jobs Program. Let's, let's make sure our kids have the skills that they need in order to be useful out there in the community. And let's keep paying attention. My son, Hugh, is here. You know, I used to say, well, there's no substitute for supervision, Hugh, so keep paying attention to our youth, and we'll make sure that we solve the crime issues on our streets. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. On, on prevention, and I would really want to look at, at the causes of, of why youth are um, are experiencing uh, issues with, with the law. And I think that really stems from looking at strengthening families. When you have stronger families, when you have parents who are not worried about how they're going to pay the bills, they can be um, they can be more attentive parents. Um, the kids that, that come from a home that is that is stable are more likely to um, perhaps consider uh, better goals than, than crime. Um, another thing that the NDP is uh, advocating for, and I certainly would as well, is uh, the concept of, of free tuition. Give kids something to work towards, give them free tuition, let them build the careers that, uh, that fit for them, and they'll give back to society tenfold. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Michael, those are comments on the question. Uh, thank you very much. So, um, this, uh, this past year we saw a, a change with some of the programming that was available to our youth, and that was the Canada Summer Job Grant Program. And every organization who wanted to participate uh, was required to sign an attestation. And so, that Canada Summer Job Grant attestation regardless of the beliefs of folks who wanted to participate in that program and employ their youth, um, required them to you know, make sure that they aligned with a very tight box that the government wanted to put around them so that it was about ideology and it wasn't about employment. And then it was about uh, making sure that you complied with you know, a, a rule that the government had put in place that had no bearing on the good and charitable work that these people were doing. Programs like that are tremendously important and they shouldn't be politicized meet the agenda of the government of the day. But I would say that when youth are employed and when they have the opportunities to give back and work for these charitable organizations, fantastic things happen, great behaviors are learned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is directed to Lorraine Reckmans and will be asked by Sue Watts. Lorraine, should you be elected what are your intentions regarding improving the state of our regional economy, specifically pertaining to small and medium-sized business? Thank you. I, I just want to let you know that we have a policy proposal, it's in our platform, that the Greens are committing to, committed to assessing every single piece of legislation that is passed to assess its impact on small business and I think that's really important. When we recognize that small business is the engine that drives this country, it needs government attention. Uh, I am committed, one of, the, one of the things that I really love about Canada is the civil, civil society and a lot of the NGOs. And I think the vibrancy, not, so not only working with small business owners in local community, but also working with non-governmental groups who are looking at the gaps uh, that government is missing. So I am, I'm committed to investing time in small business because that's where the innovation is going to come from. And as, I, as a member of a grassroots party, I see so much innovation at the ground, at the ground level. I cannot get over how innovative, imaginative, and exciting Canadians are. And uh, 
we have to invest. So, I mean, that's one of our commitments as the Greens is to invest in small business. And it is about, if you remember, and I have to say about the brand cartel, you know, pulling back. I mean, we had gone through this scandal where they were price fixing on bread. You know, so, you know, we're, we're interested in security at the regional and local level. We're interested in building resiliency in communities so that they are secure and they're not left beholden to large corporations who are controlling all the food. So thank you. Thank you, John. Thomas. So the solution again is to let those businesses open an interest-free account at the Bank of Canada. Like PayPal. How many people know about PayPal? Imagine you could walk. Imagine you could. Imagine you could log on to the Bank of Canada's computer, kids, and you could open an account for your parents. And then you could cut checks to pay off all their mortgages and interest-bearing debts with this new Bank of Canada CHIPS account you're using. Well, now all the payments go against principal, and someday your parents are out of debt. So, if you can get an interest-free account at the Bank of Canada for your parents that would work like PayPal, to get them out of debt, same would work for businesses. The businesses that are not paying any interest to the loan sharks are going to be better off. It's obvious. So save all the interest and then come and tell me if you've got any complaints left. Thank you, Jim. Very Jim, your comments. Small business is very much at the, at the heart of our economy. We realize that more and more as the economy continues to evolve here in our region. And I'm glad the question asked about regions because, or this region, because I do think we have to look at this regionally. Um, one of the things we need to do is make sure we're talking to the business community. The St. Lawrence Corridor Economic Development Commission is a, uh, a group of uh, seven municipalities and the uh, uh, business leaders in, in these communities that's standing up and saying, let's, let's look for those needs, let's work together. Um, we, I've also been out talking to the economic development officers in Leeds Grenville and Gananoque in down in Prescott, and it is fascinating to hear the uh, the proposals that they have. We have to continue to uh, work to keep the EODP in place. We have to continue to allow our work with our businesses that are locally owned and operated to enable them to scale up. You have a Canar, I see they would be here, Northern Cables. Those are the kind of businesses that are going to stick. Let's bring them here. Thank you. Thank you.
was in comments on your question. Okay, I just I want to talk about the infrastructure investment. Um, and if, you know, if you could imagine that we decided we we're going to move to a lower low carbon economy, we would require energy efficiency in every single home. And if the federal government makes transfers directly to municipalities for their infrastructure, it creates jobs, results in energy efficiency, carbon reduction, trade skills development, and jobs for youth. So, I mean, those relationships between the federal government and municipalities are so criti critical, and we know sometimes that we can't always work with the provinces. So there has to be a relationship and an investment in infrastructure directly at the municipal level. Thank you. Our final question of the evening is to John Trimble and will be asked by Tom Steele. <coughs> As a rookie MP in the House of Commons, how will you ensure that you bring benefit to our riding once you are there? <coughs> Boy, would I shake the place up. <sighs> how can full employment for youth, full employment for adults, not change your lives? You're not going to have to pay as much tax to support unemployed people. You're not going to have to pay as much tax to support the criminals who are trying to get the money they don't have because they don't have jobs. I mean, this has been done so many times in throughout history, and just recently, every time you have a church, Portugal, Russia, in the last 20 years, you can all go find this software. They talk about less. First time that software that all these crash communities all start up. I finance this software. That's why I'm so proud of it. It's my baby. And someday I'm going to be famous because of this software. I know it. They're still talking about it now, 34 years after it came out in 1984. So, you think I don't get a real charge when I hear a crash in the economy? Oh, we're studying a community currency, and they talk about the LEPs from Burnaby, Canada, the first one ever. Mine! So, there are so many alternate, look at bus bucks, do that, and that'll work, because even the stores and animals will take them. Time dollars and the time bank. Everybody needs babysitting. What happens is the mechanic starts taking well, three hours per hour. The dentist starts taking ten hours per hour. Am I not the original guy with two minutes? Yeah. All right. Wow. And so basically a support network grows around these people. So I've suggested three or four different working alternatives that can be set up. And if they ever were, you would see a huge change in your living conditions. John the Engineer. Good engineering is what I'm promising. Thank you, John. Mary Jean, comments? I would bring benefit to our riding in the same way that I've committed myself as an advocate and a volunteer and a lawyer and a mother and a grandmother and a wife all these years. I would do it with my skills and my experience with my heart, that's how I would do it. And I would also say to you that it is worth remembering that I would be on the government side should I be elected in this by-election. I have worked on the Hill, I have created the relationships that I need in order to get things done. I know the people and I'm ready to go to work. So you, one would be the rookie MP as you say, but truly I would be starting with a real leg up and it would be my pleasure to carry these priorities that we've been talking about tonight to Ottawa as your next member of Parliament. Let's remember that after 10 years of the Conservatives, there was a real move for change in 2015. We brought that change, and I want to bring that change to, right here to Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rio Lakes in order that we can all share in the benefits of it. Thank you very much. If a government is being effective, I don't think you should have to have an MP 
from that government or from that party in your writing to see the full effects if that government is, is being effective. Myself, as a rookie MP in the House of Commons, I would say that it would be a combination of working with the great NDP team that's already there. We have MPs that are doing great advocacy work. Um, again, I had uh, MP Alistair McGregor here just recently talking with uh, the farmers in our area. Um, so again, working with the existing NDP MPs and also listen and advocate. That would be my mission as your MP. I'm not here to tell you what the problems are. You're here to tell me what the problems are and it would be my job to go to the House and make sure that those uh, solutions are found and brought back to our riding. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over the past few weeks, I've had the opportunity to have uh, about a dozen members of the Conservative Caucus join me in the riding to meet with people on their doorsteps, to meet with uh, small business and medium business, medium sized business owners, and to have their concerns brought back to the House of Commons. And, you know, one thing I, I, I learned and I uh, you know, really will bring forward uh, if elected is that you know, listening and then advocating for you know, what you've heard in Ottawa is the number one responsibility of our member of parliament. And you know, uh, that became very clear to me when I became a municipal councillor and the number one issue that would get me out of bed or get me out of someone's house is water draining across the property. That's the issue that people want advocated for? Hey, I'm happy to help. But when there's, when there's commitments that have been made by government and government is failing to deliver on them, uh, like, you know, this year they budgeted compensation for victims of uh, thalidomide poisoning and have failed to deliver on it. Question asked, question answered in the House. I, I'd be there championing these causes for our Thank residents. You. Thank Thanks. you. Okay, then I think the question was about being a rookie MP. I don't think I'm a rookie, I'm a grandmother. Uh, but I think, you know, being in the House of Commons, I would be the second Green MP in the House of Commons, and I would take cues, certainly, from Elizabeth May and everything that she's been able to accomplish, not being actually even considered the leader of a political party. And again, with the Green Party, we don't have a whip to vote, so we are members of Parliament who are free to vote our conscience. And I am very, very clear that it's the House of Commons that we are common together, we are all equal, and our voice is just as important as anybody else's voice in the House of Commons. We share that house with all other Canadians, and that parties have to understand that, so that I would not have to divide my loyalties between the party's platform and the party's pursuit of power, you know, and trade that off for the interests or the benefits of the constituents in Leeds Grenville. Thank you. I can add, I'm sorry, you know all the programs, I've mentioned them all. How many times has it been a shortage of money that's caused the problem? And every time I had to say, well, they don't know what to do about not enough money, but I know what to do about not enough money. They can try this model, this model, this model, this model. Matter of fact, if you look at my registration, I put down banking systems engineer as my profession because I spent the last 40 years advocating for upgrading the Bank of Canada's computer software. You understand? This is not something hard. It's the switch of a disk. It's a software upgrade. You've all seen Mr. Spock do it umpteen times on Star Trek. Save a whole planet. He didn't need me help from the slows. He did it alone. Well, that's what the world is like now. I just got to get there with my monkey, slide the next disc over to the disc on the works. We are now, I'm now asking candidates to prepare for their closing. Uh, statements. Uh, they will close in the same order in which they open. So I'd like to invite Mary Jane McCall to uh, give us your two-minute uh, closing statement. Thank you very much, Pat. Well, it's been a remarkable evening. It's been great to have the opportunity to stand here before all of you and tell you about my priorities 
for these Crandall Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. My priorities are your priorities. As I've told you already, I have this community in my heart. I've lived, worked, and volunteered here. Ian and I raised our children here, and we have, this has been our world for, for pretty much my whole life. Went away to school and a couple years in Toronto, but uh, what uh, going away teaches you is the value and the importance of the uh, community that you live in right here. We came home to raise our kids here, and I'm very proud to say that we did that. So, you know, in 2015, when, when all was said and done, and Gord Brown, and our hearts go out to his family of the loss of Gord, when Gord Brown beat me in 2015, I got a note from someone I didn't know, and he said, you know, Mary Jean, you started a movement, and you have to keep going. And, I, and he didn't explain what the movement was, but I stopped and thought about it a lot myself over the last, I don't know, several years. And what I believe the movement is, is for real progressive change, a new voice, a new way of looking at ourselves here in Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes, a way of looking at ourselves that includes the compassionate voice that I think that we all believe we need to take to Ottawa or to any level of government in which we are active, but also that practical voice that says we know we want to create the jobs, we know we want the prosperity, we want to be able to depend on ourselves, and our government is there to give us a hand up, not a hand out. So as your next member of parliament, it would be my honor to take that philosophy, that way of looking at the world, to Ottawa, and perhaps beyond to all of Canada. And so on December 3rd, I am asking for your vote. Thank you very much. This by-election is a great opportunity to take a hard look at the track record of those in power and to closely examine the results. Again, we have our tax dollars being blindly thrown at corporations without any protection for our investment. Anyone with a shred of business sense would know better than that. We have the two other main parties so deeply committed to their rich friends that they smile and look the other way on tax loopholes while making sure that you and I are forced to toe the line. Enough is enough. There is a better path forward, and I stand for the fairness and investment that small businesses deserve. I am about great opportunities and a strong economy. I am about stable, well-paying jobs and workers' rights. I am about ensuring that no one gets away with defrauding our country because they padded the right pocket. With your vote, I will bring strong advocacy and commitment to conscience to the House of Commons. This coming Monday, please go out and vote for someone who is genuinely passionate about helping everyone in our society to reach their full potential. I am not beholden to any large do donors, and I have no hidden agendas. I am in this to bring the prosperity that I know is within reach to our riding and all of Canada. In this election and in the future, please think about your priorities and which candidate best represents them. Don't just vote by color or habit. Make each of us up here really earn your support. Parties, leaders, and policies change. Every election is a chance to re-examine what's on the table. I hope that investigation leads you to mark my name on your ballot, and I look forward to bringing strong representation to our riding on December 3rd. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Michael, could I please ask you to deliver your closing comments? Yeah, thank you uh, again for hosting this evening. Thanks to the Ontario to the other candidates for participating in a civil exchange of ideas and for all of you for coming out. So, I spent the last four years looking to create jobs. And I'm very proud of the team, being part of a team that was able to create hundreds of jobs. And I think that's so important. If we want to encourage young people to stay here, if we want to encourage people to move here, we need to have great jobs. And we need to have great infrastructure and great services available to those people. We also need to have a government that's willing to set the example, just like uh, in municipalities, 
aren't able to deficit budget, we should expect that a federal government doesn't only budget in deficit for the totality of their mandate and beyond and project it into the 2040s by their own accountability office. I served with the men and women in the Canadian Forces because I love our country. And I served on municipal council because I love my community. And I served as the Riding Association President for our Member of Parliament because I'm a principled conservative. And I knew that I had a lot to learn from someone who had our community's best interests at heart. I learned a lot from Gord Brown, and our community benefited from his service. I would be honored to continue that legacy of service, that legacy of advocacy, and to be your representative in Ottawa, to take the message from Leeds Granville Thousand Islands of Rio Lakes back to the House of Commons. On December 3rd, I'm asking for you to vote for Michael Barrett. I'm asking you to vote for the Conservative Party of Canada, and I thank you very much for your time this evening. I would like to thank you all for your attention. I'd like to thank you all for listening to me. I hope that you found me smart, intelligent, entertaining, and kind. I just want to tell you that I am courageous. I want to tell you that this is a by-election, that we're all going to be here again in 2019. This is a litmus test, I, and I have been encouraging voters to vote green in this by-election, and I propose that it's a sort of no-risk uh, guarantee, you know, if you don't like me, you can throw me back next year. <laughs> but it is a by-election, it is an opportunity that Canadians have, or that you have in this writing specifically, to send a message to Ottawa, to send a message that you think climate change is important. Because that's why I'm here. My grandchildren picked this riding. My husband and I moved here almost 20 years ago. We started a business. Our grandchildren are born here. This is our home. This is our community. And like any good nester, you like to make your community vibrant. You like to make it safe and secure so that your children have a good place to grow up. I have adopted these people. I came here. And I'm here because I care. I care about you. But all of the candidates on the ballot, we are offering ourselves up to be at your service. We are offering ourselves up as helpers. And on December 3rd, I hope you remember that. And I hope you consider me as a candidate and that you would put it next beside my name. Miigwech. Statement. Well, I'm not really offering myself up, I'm offering up my software. Back in the Sheila Cobb spy election in 1996 with this headline, Super Loser Fails Again, I kept saying, I don't even get elected, I just need one person with a brain to go pick up the software and do it yourselves. Now, no candidate has ever caught on. No opposing candidate ever caught on. But exactly one month after that insulting headline, Hamilton Health Self-Help Group starts up Hamilton Lead System. Mission accomplished. So I did create some employment in Hamilton, even if I didn't get elected. Now, everything I've said tonight, I'm willing to bet on. Okay? I'm willing to bet anybody that it's warmer, it's not warmer now than when Greenland was green. Anybody want to make a hundred dollar bet that it's warmer now than when Greenland was green? Of course not, yet they still keep stopping the law. And I'm not happy about that, and I'm insulted when I point out that I got a science degree, 100% in physics, and I don't see no warming. And they still see me got to pay a carbon tax. You pay a carbon tax. I'm not interested. Now, you can Google for Great Canadian Gambler. I come up. And if you ever saw the movie Rounders with Matt Damon, every card game's got its guy is called a professor. <laughs> Well, I was called the professor at the Trump Taj Mahal in the Rounders movie because I was the great white shark took the biggest bites out of your bankroll when you went up against me. So, they are going to rape 
your kids with high interest rates, it's coming, don't you feel it? Isn't it like the 1980s? Remember the big layoffs, 10,000 at a time? We lived through that. It's happening again to your kids, your grandchildren, as it happened to you. And guess what? I think you all deserve it. Thank you, John. We're now finished the formal part of our evening. We've had excellent food for thought from each candidate. And I know that our audience here is better informed for the difficult choices that are before each of us as we go to the voting booth this Monday. We've been taping this meeting. Where's uh, Dale? Yay. There's Dale. Um, so the camera guy has been diligently taping this meeting. We're hoping to get that up on our chamber website as soon as possible. And. Um, so, please remember to get out to vote on December 3rd. If you need help with anything, contact Elections Canada or any of our local campaign offices. Thank you very much for your time and attention, and I hope everyone has a wonderful evening.